Thank you for tuning into this message online or on podcast format. We're so glad that you're able to hear the Word of God. Uh, we'd encourage you to also uh, get into the Word of God on a regular basis on your own. There's no substitute for reading the Word of God yourself. And so we'd encourage you to download a Bible app. Uh, in addition to that, uh, if you're not part of a local church body, we'd love for you to consider being a part of Christ Community Church. Or if you're not in our area, finding a gospel-centered, uh, Bible-based church in your home area to be a part of. There's no substitute for real fellowship with the body of Christ. So we hope that you enjoy this message. We hope that it really blesses your life. And if you would like to support us financially, you can go to our website and do that as well so we can continue to spread, spread the gospel to those in the world around us. Have a great day. God bless you. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the resurrection and the life. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Happy Palm Sunday, everybody. How you guys doing this morning? So say what's up to everybody in the room, our online campus, our North Campus. What's up to you guys as well? Can we welcome the online and North Campus guys? Welcome. It's Palm Sunday. I got a question before we jump in. How many of us in the room, online, North Campus, how many of us have ever taken a road trip before? Anybody? Road trip? I'm not talking about a three or four hour drive up to New Hampshire or Vermont for the weekend. I'm talking about like a 18 plus hours takes a couple days to get where you're going. You, anybody ever, ever done that? As many of you know, my family and I moved up here from Texas three and a half years ago so that I could come on the amazing staff here at Christ Community Church. I love it. Love it. I love you. I love our staff. But when we did that, we literally left all of our living family down in Texas. As a matter of fact, my mom is watching right now. She's probably getting sad with me just talking about it, so I'm sorry, Mom. I love you. But my son is 15 years old, and he's awesome. By the way, if you don't know him, you should get to know him. He will literally make you die laughing. He's hilarious. But over the last three and a half years, we've taken some road trips, me and him, down to Texas three or four times together to visit family. It takes 25 hours to drive from my house down the street in Berkeley to my dad's house in Henderson, Texas. And, and road trips are one of those things, at least for me, that when you talk about them, it's really fun and awesome to talk about, but then in actuality, it kind of sucks, <laughs> you know? And, and our, the road trips with my son, they always start off the same way. We get super hyped up about how much fun this is going to be, and we talk about all the awesome, amazing things that we're going to do. It's going to be, we're like, dude, it's you and me. We're sleeping in hotels that cost $20 a night. We're going to eat gas station sushi. And it's just going to be a good time. We get all excited about all the things that come with a road trip, but something always happens in our road trips about six hours in. About six hours in, we've talked, we've laughed, we've told stories. He's napped four or five times. We've eaten highly questionable foods. We've almost gotten into car accident after car accident because I do not pay attention. But about six hours in, we're just ready to get where we're going. And that feeling always intensifies on the way back. Why? Because now, man, we're just ready to get home. Just ready to get home. I'm ready to be in my comfort zone. I'm ready to be in my safe space. I'm ready to see my wife. I'm ready to see my friends. I'm generally ready to get back to work. But most importantly, I'm ready to sleep in my own bed 
with my own pillow and get rest. Road trips aren't restful. And the reason I bring this up, and many of you maybe can already see where I'm going with this, but the reason I bring it up is because there's a spiritual counterpart to what we see in the physical, in our lives. Every human being who has ever lived, whoever will live, whether they want to admit it or not, is searching for rest. They're searching for an ultimate rest. And ingrained in each and every one of us is a longing and a desire to get to this ultimate eternal home and to find an ultimate internal rest, a rest for our souls that lasts forever. So look with me at our passage this morning. John chapter 14, verse 6. You don't have to stand, but I am going to ask you to read it with me. It's just one verse. And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Lord Jesus, as we try to focus in a little bit this morning on what this means, I'm asking you for your Holy Spirit. Lord, because you're not here physically, because we can't see you, we need your Holy Spirit to guide our hearts, Lord. Guide our thoughts, guide our minds. Help us to see the truth. Open our eyes to understand the scriptures this morning, Lord. We invite you. We need you. We love you, Lord. Meet with us this morning. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So one of the, um, one of the points that I wanted to, to make this morning, there's a very large percentage of our world that believes in what we just talked about and believes in an afterlife. And I looked at a few different polls uh, this week, getting ready for today, and according to whichever one you look at, uh, there's anywhere between 73 and 93 percent of the population of the world believes that this life that we're currently living is not the end. And I think that probably according to Scripture, we, we might could argue that that, that number is probably a little bit closer to 100 percent, but... We're going to go with statistics that we can find on the internet today just for our sake of our conversation. But most of the world's population believes that there is an afterlife. They believe in a spiritual realm that comes whenever our bodies fail and our spirits and our souls continue to live on. And, and that afterlife can generally go one of two ways, with eternal conscious torment or eternal rest and eternal life. Essentially, what we're talking about is heaven and hell here. So according to the information that we see in our world, not just in our culture here in the United States, but in our world, we seem to have dozens and dozens and dozens of options on how we can get to heaven, how we can find this ultimate soul rest that we're all looking for. And some of those ways include uh, there's a group that, that doesn't believe that anything happens, that when you die, your body just kind of goes into the earth and that's end. You just cease to have consciousness. It's over. But there's others who believe uh, in, in what we call reincarnation. In, in fact, it, it says that um, when they die, they will come back as other beings and, and they try to achieve enough good works to where they, they finally achieve what we call nirvana. And I'm not talking about the band, although they got some good jams. <laughs> you, you know when you're driving down the street and you hear, Dan and Aunt, chicka, chicka, Dan, Aunt, you're like, yeah, da, da. So anyway, but that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is, um, is, is they call it nirvana, and it's this blissful spiritual state of ultimate being. And basically, they live over and over and over again until they do enough good to achieve reaching this nirvana. And there's other uh, belief systems that are very similar to that, but it, it includes having millions and millions of gods and goddesses. There's a religion that speaks of a paradise where the faithful will live with Allah in the afterlife, and those who don't make it are subject to, to judgment, and the entry into heaven is based on the adherence to the pillars of their faith to the, the readings of the Quran 
and to die as a martyr. But my point is that because most of us in the world believe in heaven, they believe in this place of ultimate and eternal soul rest, and because there are so many religions and cults and societies and people claiming to have the answers, it raises a lot of questions in us, doesn't it? It raises questions like, which one of these options is right? (laughs) First of all, how do I get there? What's the way? And thank God, Jesus answered that in our passage today. We've already read it, but I'm going to quote it again. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Appreciate it, guys. Good talk. (laughs) Just kidding. But our takeaway this morning is this. Jesus is not merely a guide. He is the way. He gets us to himself through himself. It's a little bit longer of a takeaway but good points. Jesus is not merely a guide. He is the way. Jesus gets us to himself through himself. And let me, let me try to unpack for us a little bit what we mean by that. I want to give us a little bit more context as to what's going on in our passage here other than Jesus just making this remarkable claim. You see, Jesus made this statement at his last meal before he died. And This was a few days after he had entered into Jerusalem and the people were acknowledging that he is the Messiah and they were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they were laying palm branches down on the path as he rode into the city on a donkey. We celebrate that day every year. We're celebrating that day today. At the beginning of Holy Week, we call it Palm Sunday for obvious reasons. But... Just so you guys know, that is one of the two times we're going to mention Palm Sunday in this message today. So if you came this morning looking for a traditional Palm Sunday message, I'm sorry, but you can feel free to email me. I'll take those at matt.thornton, CCC family. (laughs) But where we are in our passage today, it's just a few days after all of that happened, after that very first Palm Sunday. You see, Jesus has a disciple, a meal with his disciples we, we know it as the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper, and this was where communion was institute, instituted, and this was the very last food that Jesus was going to eat before he dies that we know of. And this is where our passage is taking place. And what we need to understand, though, is that this meal, it's not just a relaxed meal of hangout time with Jesus and his boys having a meal, kicking a few back to celebrate the Passover. That's not what's going on. You see, there's, there's more than likely a level of uneasiness in the room at this point in the night. And I want us to try to grasp that a little bit. Because Jesus has been saying some troubling things to his disciples for the past few days leading up to this moment. And in particular, he's been saying some very troubling, troubling things that very day. And I'm not going to read all of it, but I'm just going to kind of paraphrase the story for you to get, get the point across. But in the last few hours of this day, Jesus has been saying some stuff to his, to his disciples. He's been saying things like, listen, guys, you remember how I, I, I told you that I was going to get murdered? You remember how I told you that I was going to be delivered into the hands of sinners and, and they were going to kill me? Well, that's about to happen. But before that happens, I'm going to suffer tremendously. There's going to be illegal trials. There's going to be false witnesses. I'm going to get flogged. I'm going to get scourged. I'm going to get crucified. As a matter of fact, in less than 24 hours from now, you guys are going to be putting my body in a tomb. And in even less time than that, in just a few hours, soldiers are going to come and they're going to arrest me. Oh, and by the way, it's one of you who's going to turn me over. This is troubling information for the disciples to hear that day. Jesus has been saying some troubling things. And then Peter pipes in and he says, Nah, Lord, this isn't going to happen to you. 
If that's going to happen to you, it's going to happen. They're going to have to go through me first. It's going to happen over my dead body. And Jesus says to Peter, no, no, Peter. Peter, as a matter of fact, you're going to betray me not once, not twice, but three times tonight. And the rest of you, you're going to get scared and you're all going to run away to your own homes. And I'm going to face this alone. This is troubling information for just disciples to hear. Would you agree? And we need to remember that they had just hailed Jesus as the Messiah a few days early, earlier on that Palm Sunday. And this is not what they were expecting to happen. This is not how they had envisioned things going. Things were supposed to be different when the Messiah showed up. Messiah was supposed to come in and he was going to free the Jewish people from under Roman rule. He was going to sit in the temple. He was going to reinstate Israel as the chosen people of God with his military power. Everything was supposed to go well at this point. This isn't how it was supposed to be. Things were supposed to be better. And on top of all of the troubling things that Jesus has been saying to his disciples, can you imagine how heavy the atmosphere must have been in Jesus' spirit? Because Jesus knew what was coming, guys. Think about that for a second. He knew everything that was coming his way. And I think sometimes, especially in church settings, we tend to look at the godness of Jesus and we overlook the humanity of Jesus. He's truly God, yes, we worship him as that, but he's also truly man. So consider the emotional and the spiritual heaviness that he must have been carrying in those moments. He knew that the betrayal from his friends was coming. The fear of the physical pain that was coming his way, knowing the bitter hurtfulness of the mocking that he was going to receive from people that he would literally die for, he knew it was coming. He knew that he was about to be in the garden pleading with his father, Father, if it's possible for there to be another way, please let there be another way. Please. He knew the spiritual weight of the vilest sins that anyone has ever committed, including you and me, was about to be poured out on him who knew no sin. And he knew that the eternal fellowship with his father that he always had known was about to be temporarily torn to the point where he would cry out and say, Father, why have you forsaken me? He knew all of this was coming. There's some heavy stuff going on on this night, guys. It was different. Troubled hearts abounded. Troubled minds abounded. Troubled spirits are everywhere. And look what Jesus does in the middle of all of the troubled hearts and minds and spirits and all of the chaos. Look what he does. He pauses to bring comfort to his friends. And can I just pause for a minute here and can we just stand in awe of the character of Jesus for a second, guys? Think about it. His character, his nature. I was listening to Matt Chandler preach on this exact passage when I was getting ready for this one. And he said something, he pointed something out that I overlooked, but it's very much worth mentioning here. And I don't even care if you know where I got the thought. You know, sometimes God speaks to us through other people. But here, Jesus is in the middle of all of his own stuff that he's got going on. And he pauses to comfort his friends. The nature of Jesus is something like we've never seen before. He's gentle, he's lowly, he's compassionate, he's kind, he's gracious, he's merciful. And Jesus could have easily said in this moment, you know what, guys, good meal. By the way, you're welcome for all that stuff that I told you that was going to happen so you know before it happens. But come on, guys, we got to go. I got to get to the garden. I got to pray. I'm dealing with some stuff. I got to go talk to my dad. I got to deal with me. And none of us would have thought anything of it. But he, he sees his disciples troubled, and he loved them. He loved them deeply. John 13 tells us that Jesus, knowing that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, he loved them to the end. So he sees them troubled, and he brings them comfort. This is what he says. John 14, starting in verse 1, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. 
Believe also in me, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is not just a guide. Jesus is the way. He gets us to himself through himself. And Jesus sees his friends in distress, and the first words he speaks to them are words of comfort. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled, guys. And then he begins to comfort them, not just with comforting words, but with powerful claims about himself that they are going to need to remember. Powerful claims about himself for them to cling to in the days that are coming. In other words, what Jesus is doing here is he's offering comfort, not just for the moment, but comfort for the future when things look really, really, really dark. Because Jesus sees the need for their comfort in the heaviness of the moment, the present moment that's going on, but he also sees the need for their comfort in the darkest times that he knows are coming in the next 18 hours when they are going to look at his tattered body and his ribboned flesh as he suffocates and bleeds out on a cross, and they're going to think, maybe we were wrong about this dude. But he comforts them by reminding them to have faith, to trust in God. Verse 1, he says, Believe in God. Believe also in me. But there's something more at play in the wording here. Other translations that aren't the ESV, but there's a couple other translations where Jesus says, you believe in God, believe also in me. And sometimes it's hard for us to read words and hear vocal inflections And a lot of times we'll read, you believe in God, believe also in me. But Jesus isn't giving two separate commands here. Rather, he's making a statement in the first half of the sentence, and he's giving a command in the second half of the sentence. Essentially, what he's saying is, you already believe in God. You've proven that. You already believe in a God that you don't see, a God who is spirit. That's the statement. And then he gives the command, believe also in me. You already believe in a God that you don't see, so believe in me also, especially in the coming days when you're not going to see me because I've got to go away. He's saying to his disciples, things are about to get really dark, but even in the darkness, there is a God at work who's working all things out for your good. Keep trusting. Keep having faith. Keep pressing in. He's saying there's painful, there's scary, there's hard moments coming in the days ahead. And I'm not going to be here, guys. Moments where you're going to question and you're going to hurt and you're going to weep and you're going to be confused and you will not understand. But this is why you must have faith. This is why you must trust. Because you won't understand, you're going to need to have faith. You're going to need to trust. You're going to need to believe. And he goes on to offer more comforting words when he says this in verse 2. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And so there's something that we need to point out here because I think this verse kind of gets misrepresented a lot. It gets misunderstood, misexplained, if that's even a word. Because if you've been around a church for any amount of time, you may have, like I have, heard this verse explained by a Sunday school teacher or a well-meaning vacation Bible school worker that the reason Jesus is leaving the earth And so he can go up to heaven and physically go build houses for all of God's children up in heaven. And that the reason that it's taken so long for him to return is because he's just up there in heaven just working as a carpenter, just building houses. No. Jesus isn't telling his disciples, hey guys, I'm going to the Father. I'm going to be Bob the Builder for a minute with a 
hard hat, giant tool belt. It's not like Eric Lamba and Evandro walking around here fixing stuff up. But rather, what Jesus is saying is, guys, my Father's house, heaven, it has many rooms. In other words, there's space there. And I'm going to prepare a place for you, not by building houses, but by going to the cross and building a bridge that's going to take you to the Father. He's not saying, I'm going to prepare uh, houses for you. He's saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you by doing all of the work necessary for you to have eternal life. I'm going to prepare a way for you to get to my Father's banquet table, and I'm going to make sure that you've got a seat there. I'm going to do all the work necessary for you to be able to come to God and to commune with God, and all you have to do is trust And when I'm done preparing the way, I'm going to bring you to where I am also. I'm going to make sure that you get home. See, Jesus isn't just a guide. He's the way. He brings us to himself, through himself. And this is where Thomas comes in and he says, but Jesus, we don't know the way. We don't know the way. And Jesus replies with our passage today. He says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And the unfortunate part about our verse today, the one that we're looking at the most, is that this verse has often been used to create controversy, hasn't it? Because we see it all the time. If there's like an apologetics debate between like a Christian and a Muslim, this always gets thrown up. We see it all the time. In the comment section of Facebook, my favorite place to be. We see it all the time, though, don't we? Somebody makes a post that somebody else disagrees with, and so they're like, uh-uh, Jesus, white truth lie. No man comes to the Father except through him. And it's true, but now this, this, this verse has just been used as an argument, and it puts a, a barrier in the way of people and the way because we're using it to be jerks to people. And I don't think that controversy is the reason that Jesus made this statement at all because this entire section of Scripture that we've been looking at today, Jesus is bringing comfort to his disciples. That's his sole intent in all of the things that he's saying. So why then, when one of them comes to him with an honest question, a real question, and says, Jesus, we don't know. We don't understand. Why then all of a sudden would Jesus be like, you know what, I'm done comforting these clowns. I'm about to say some controversy. You know, it doesn't even make sense for him to do that. And I don't think that weaponizing this verse to win an argument in a comment section is something that we should do either. And if you're here today and you're searching, I hope that's not how you take this. We're not weaponizing this at all. We're we're giving it to you for your comfort so that you can know that there is a way to God. What Jesus was saying is stop searching, stop working, stop trying to earn your way to heaven. Just trust me. I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to get you home. You see, church, Today, Jesus is telling us that he is not just a guide. He is the way, and he's going to bring us home. He's going to bring us to himself, through himself. And this is the most comforting news that we could ever receive, I think. And let me tell you why. Because there's a a chasm, a barrier, a canyon, so to speak, that separates us from God. And it's our sin. Our sin is is the chasm. It was true for the disciples. It's true for us. And because we're separated in and of ourselves, that means that our final destination at the end of this road trip of life is hell. And we deserve it. We do. Because we're sinful. And God is holy. But therefore, in order for us to make it to heaven, to this place of ultimate rest, we need a Savior. 
And the unfortunate part is that everything that surrounds us today is telling us that we can save ourselves, that we can get ourselves home. Most of the other world religions, some of them that we touched on this morning, they claim to have a way to eternal life, but all of those ways put the work on us. They force us to forge our own truth and to forge our own path and to become our own savior. They say, do enough good works and you're going to make it. Pay enough money and you're going to make it. If you die as a martyr, you'll make it. Follow enough rules, you'll make it. Keep trying hard enough and you're going to make it. And if you don't, you get another chance. You're going to come back as another life form and then you can do enough good works that way and hopefully you don't have to waste one of those lives as someone's pet. I mean... Because, I mean, what can you do to earn eternal life if you're a dog? They say, do this, do that, do this, work, 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 work. You can get there. Trust in yourself. All roads lead to heaven. And you can work hard enough to get there. That's not what Jesus says. And on top of that, we know that Jesus can be trusted because we have the benefit of looking at it from this side of the cross. We know that he testifies about himself and that his word was true. He's saying to us today, he's telling us this morning that he's done all the work. He has prepared the way, not by building houses in heaven, but by building a bridge to gap the chasm that separates us from communion with God. And all we have to do is trust this morning. He says, I'm going to bring you safely home when you come to me. I've done all the work. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so the question that we have this morning is, where are you at today? Who are you trusting in to get you home? Jesus is calling us to trust in him. And maybe you've, never, maybe you've never done that before. Maybe you've never come to him for your salvation. You've been searching. You've been trying your best to be good. You've been working. You've been paying money. You've been trying to earn your way to heaven. Listen to the words of Jesus this morning for your comfort. When he says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. You already believe in God. You're here. You're at least open. Believe also in me. I've done the work. I'm going to get you home. So if you're here today and you hear his voice, and you've never given your life to him, I would just encourage you not to harden your heart this morning. He's already made a way And all you have to do is come. And if you don't know how, if you don't know what to do, there's really not a lot to do other than posture your heart before God. He sees your heart. But if you wanted to pray, you could pray something similar to this. Lord Jesus, I know that my sin separates me from communion with God and I have been searching and I have been looking and I have been trying far too hard to forge my own way to him. And, but Lord, I, I'm trusting you for my salvation. Thank you for providing a way by your death on the cross and your resurrection. And there's others of us who may be here and we find ourselves in a very similar situation to where the disciples were on Friday afternoon. The lives completely turned upside down. Chaos, trouble. Are you brokenhearted today? 
You feel empty? Are you caught up in sin? Are you caught up in anxiety? Is your marriage failing? Are your kids walking far from the Lord? Are you battling an addiction? Are the cares of the world consuming you? Does it seem like you've been praying and he's not there? He's nowhere to be seen. But I want to bring you comfort this morning. and I want to encourage you by asking you as well to remember the words of Jesus. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You already believe in God. Believe in me. Trust me. I'm doing the work, especially when you can't see it. I'm going to get you home. And for the rest of us, I just believe in my spirit that Jesus is simply reminding us this morning to continue to come. For those of us who are just trucking through life, don't neglect to come to him, not just today, but every day. On that very first Palm Sunday, people were making a path for Jesus, inviting him in. They were committing to follow him. But I just want to remind you this morning that the Christian walk is a daily process of preparing the way for Jesus to guide our hearts. Every day we need him. And to steal something very cheesy from Pastor Matt that he said to me earlier this week, we need Jesus every day that ends with a Y. So wherever you are today, come to Christ. He's going to get you home. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And he is the reward. He's not a guide. He is the way. He will get us to himself through himself. Not just for eternal life in the future, but guess what? For your abundant life now. He offers you abundant life now. All you have to do is come. And I'll close with this. The only thing standing in the way of the way is us. Come to Christ this morning. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for the encouraging words that you have spoken to us this morning. Lord, for our comfort, thank you for building a bridge for us to get to God the Father when there was no way that we could have done it on our own. Thank you for your gentle and lowly nature that loves to run and save sinners. Lord, I pray for the hearts, if you're speaking to anyone here, Lord, whether they've never given their life to you this morning or whether they're straying from you and they need to come back or maybe they just needed the reminder that every day we need you to guide us on the way, Lord. Lord God, I pray that you would soften their hearts now, Lord, and help them to respond however you would have them, Lord. We love you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to sing. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you've been blessed by the service. If you don't have a church home, we would love for you to consider being a part of Christ Community Church. And you can connect with us by going to cccfamily.com. Let us know that you've been uh, joining us for church. You can fill out the online connect card there. Give us your information. We can help you take the next step. If you have a prayer concern that you'd like our prayer teams to pray about, you can do that as well. If you'd like to support the ministry here at Christ Community Church, you can also give online at cccfamily.com and we appreciate all that God is doing in and through each and every one of you. Hey, thanks again for joining us this week. We look forward to seeing you again soon, either online or in person. God bless you.